three, two, and one. Welcome back to the Love Over Fear podcast. And on today's show, I have the man with me, Nathan Brown. Brownie, how are you? Hi, Woodsy. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm kind of truly honored, humbled, stoked to be here. So I know we've kind of only known each other a short amount of time, but it feels like we've known each other forever already. So yeah, stoked to be here. Thank you. Mate, since you've uh, come into my life, I think it was about <clears throat> nine weeks ago. We did, we did the six week men's meditation course. Yep. Um, yeah, we're in Fitsum, Fit State of Mind, located on Sydney's Absolutely. Northern Beaches in Motorvale. Thanks for Rob Pisto for Absolutely, allowing us Robbie. to host this special little uh, podcast. And you know, Rob connected us, and I just feel like you've been such a beautiful, fresh breath of air in my life. And the reason I say that is because when you meet a man who's done some work on himself, he's just comfortable and confident and just happy to be himself and bring that consistent energy yep. to whatever it is that he's doing. And, you know, I've really enjoyed that part of um, your energy in my life. So thank you very much. Oh man, thanks. Thanks very much for that. That's uh, very kind words. Um, I kind of feel the same way about you. I'm, I'm kind of comfortable being uncomfortable these days. And, you know, that I think jumping in and doing the six week meditation course uh, with you um, via Rob from Fitsum was kind of part of that being comfortably uncomfortable. And uh, yeah, it's been a kind of life changing couple of months, I think, so thank you. It's so good. And uh, the other day, and we'll get into the podcast that you've created with your friend Luke, yep. uh, but you, you know, you echoed those sentiments of like, you know, how um, much meditations change your life. And I really look forward to maybe towards the back end of this conversation when we talk about how you've overcome some, a few things in your life. Yep where meditation fits and, um, you know, maybe disbanding and uh, pulling apart some of the myths yeah, that even you may have had prior to this. Oh, 100%. I was a skeptic of meditation nine weeks ago. I, I didn't, didn't go to that class being dragged, kicking and screaming, but I was definitely went there not expecting to get the tools that I got out of it. So, yeah, I'm excited to kind of dive into that and whatever else we're talking about today. I'm, I'm talent today, so I'm not used to being on the other side of the microphone. So... Isn't Let's it nice go. though? You just get to turn up. Uh, roll in. I'm a bit, bit pissed off that my all blue M&Ms aren't here, but that's okay. <laughs> They're coming. I'll send Robbie down there in the, in the audience. Rob, oh, BP shut now. Um, you were a bit pissed off about the, uh, the closet choice. Like I didn't tell you that I was going to be wearing a jersey today. Oh, yeah. You're and, sitting um, here in the uh, D Rose Chicago jersey. I, um, I'm a jersey hoarder, not just basketball. So I've got hundreds of sporting jerseys so i'm disappointed that i didn't get the heads up yes <laughs> i apologize the reason i wanted to wear this because i wanted to know what your thoughts were in your podcast you have a discussion there it's like who would win in a one-on-one -on -one game of pickup d rose pre-acl injury mm -hmm. or like jordan in his prime mm -hmm. well i just wanted to know what you thought about that oh jordan's too big i think i, I don't think rose can get around him right even with that speed yeah i think jordan's just too big jordan don't lose one-on-one -on -one. Yeah, well, there yeah. you go. You there you go, you like heard those. it here first. I mean, bless Derek Rose. Uh, bummer that his kind of career went the way it did, but he's had a nice little fight back in the kind of past 12 months. Who's he even play for now? Is it still the Pistons? I it's thought he was um, going to be verging on gone. Jo joining uh, the Lakers, your favourite teammate. That was oh, a rumour. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Rondo, at Rondo to the Clippers, Rose to the Lakers, you reckon? Could be. Wow. Well, Could be. As long as Chris Paul doesn't go there, I'll be happy. <laughs> Who's your team? Um, mate, I don't really have a team. You just like NBA. I, do, I, like, I like characters. And yep. the reason I like Derek Rose and the reason I wanted to wear this jersey today was because I think D Rose's journey embodies uh, a recovery. Sure, absolutely. And the reason I love D Rose is because I, I have a recovery, an injury in, in part of my journey. Yep. And you know, also that comes the territory that comes with that is also a non-physical healing process. Yep. Um, of which I want to get into sure. your story. Before we, we get into like your history and your process and your journey, yep. do you want to tell everyone sort of what your background is? Uh, you've been involved in action sports for a number of years. Do you want yep. to tell everyone about your progression in that? Yeah, so I um, I work in the action sports live, live entertainment industry. I have done so for 16 years. I, I started in the Krusty Demons of Dirt, which is kind of more dirt bikes and, and kind of demonic as the name suggests. And then that rolled into Nitro Circus these days, which is 
a lot more family orientated. It, it, it kind of wasn't my plan. I didn't, like I had a BMX and skateboard as a kid, but I, I always loved rugby league. That was my first true passion. And out, I finished school and, I, and I've only ever had two full-time jobs. And my first full-time job, I was working in a plumbing supplies store, Trade Link Plumbing Supplies in Brookvale. And I just remember for three years, every day hating going to work. I just like, I just do not like this job. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna work for, like I hate working, how am I gonna do this for 50 years? And then my dad pulled me aside and said like, Nathan, like you love rugby league. Like you've been counting stats in, since you've watched <laughs> rugby league as a five, six year old. That's why Lucas always jokes on our podcast and I'm a stats guy, I've always loved numbers. So I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna, I, how do I get a job in rugby league though? Like every, every 19, 20 year old wants to work in rugby league, right? So I did this sports management course, just a one year course at the Australian Business, Business Academy. And as part of that course, I got some work placement at the New South Wales Rugby League Academy. Mm. So I did three, three months there to, to get this advanced diploma of sports management. And, and the course wrapped up and the work placement um, finished and I was like, can I just stay on? Like, I'm, like, I don't have to be paid. Like, just like, um, if a job comes up, I just want to be here and ready for it. And the guy, like, I think now at the time I may have been, it was essentially an internship. I was just not getting paid, but I loved going to work and we we're working with um, school skills um, programs. And then the summer holidays came and that job kind of wrapped up for about six weeks. And I was like, see you again in February. Let's, I'll just keep chipping away. And I was mowing lawns as a little side hustle. And then, then a job opportunity came up at the Krusty Demons and I, I kind of just had to take it, like January 27th, 2005. So I was just about to start the rugby league internship again. And, and then it was kind of like that sliding doors moment. I, I, I gave up on the rugby league uh, working career to now 16 and a half years later in the action sports world as I kind of do do a little bit of everything, but if I had to give myself a job title, like I'm a marketing director and digital content producer, but mm. just hype guy, yep. simplified version. And I mean, guys listening to this, don't underestimate the evolution of action sports and where it fits in the world today. Yep. I remember watching Krusty Demons 1, mm -hmm. um, all the movies, in, you know, the Nitro Circus that Travis Petrastrana and, yep. and your mates now yeah, my friends, were yeah, creating absolutely, back yeah. in the day and how this like global juggernaut of yeah. this, like you call it like a traveling circus. Yeah, but absolutely. In terms yeah, 1994 of was the... Um, kind of the birth of freestyle motocross on the back of the very first Krusty Demons DVD. So I wasn't there for the first wave, but I was definitely second generation of action sports and have just seen it evolve into, yeah, just a huge, huge beast of a sport and industry, and which I love and am lucky to these days to call like people like Travis Pastrana, one of my great friends, done a lot of work with Seth Enslow and, and, and Ryan Williams. So yeah, luck, lucky to call a lot of those guys my friends as well, so for sure. That's so cool. And um, me having done a sport and exercise science degree, parallel to that degree, a lot of the um, sport and exercise management students, like the subjects interfuse. Yep. And so, you know, looking at your career and, and the experiences you've had and the people you've been able to connect yeah. with and now call your best friends. Yeah. Most people who've done that sport and exercise management degree would put your role probably at one of the pinnacle jobs yeah, for in sure. sport, you know, yeah. especially over the last, you know, 15 years or however long you've been in it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do pinch myself a lot of the times. Like I am one of the people who's very lucky to enjoy doing what they do. And for the most part, like it's not all, all as glitzy and as glamorous as you know social me media and how we portray it. But I mean, I've, I've had an amazing life experience doing doing what I've done and got to travel the world and you know met some of the best people in the world, seen some amazing places. Yeah, so I'm very thankful for that path, even if it did cause a few problems along the way, which yeah. I'm sure we're getting to. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> I uh, just wanted to ask you, what, what do you think is the most amazing physical feat you've seen an athlete perform whilst you've been working with these guys? What's really taken your breath away to date? Oh, God, that's a good question. I'd say probably there's a guy called Bruce Cook who um, broke his back at a, at, at a Nitro Circus show um, attempting a, the world's first double front flip in January 2014. So he told he was never gonna ride a dirt bike again, let alone walk. And, and so he's a paraplegic and then 
nine months later, he, him and his mechanic had built this kind of um, jigged up bike, which was basically the key component of this bike was a cable tire, which made sure his legs wouldn't, wouldn't flail out of this dirt bike whilst he was upside down. And, and he, him backflipping that dirt bike was probably the, probably the, I mean, I get goosebumps talking about that. Probably that was probably the, the one biggest moment to stand out, but there's been so many. I'd say that one, because he's, he's got a great documentary. You should check it out. It's called Never Say Can't on YouTube. Mm. And it's just about a guy who was, whose whole dream was taken away from him and he, he found a way. That is amazing. Yeah, it's, I, I got chills. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing story, man. Yeah, you, I mean, having you know my story, but I had yep. to let go of my sport and exercise yep. science, strength and conditioning side yep. of myself, and, and evolve in a different way. But yep. there's just something about there's something really beautiful in uh, picking up with what's happened and, and making the utter best of it. Yep. Which, yeah, and there's another guy, Wheels, who's um, who's in a wheelchair. That's why his nickname's Wheels or not in a wheelchair on it. So that's what he says. And he's got spina bifida, so he's got minimal use of his legs and he, he back flips the gigantic ramp and front flips it. I mean, he's he's a guy that gets the crowd going like no one else. And he's just just a humble kid from Vegas. And so, yeah, that's another one probably. Mm. But I mean, there's, there's spectacular mind blowing feats every, every time we do a show, really. Like, <laughs> lots of great stories coming back from injuries. And unfortunately, there's lots of, like I know, lot, uh, a handful of guys that have died doing this sport and lots of guys who've retired before their time like what your kind of story as well and had to find a different path because they they were too broken down and especially in the early years when i was there that even the athletes themselves didn't really consider themselves a serious sport you know they were rebels breaking away from the serious sport of supercross and so they didn't take professional athlete life super seriously. Like they weren't going to the gym, they weren't meditating, they weren't, they were like partying and, you know, doing all the bad stuff. And then kind of in the last probably seven to eight years, it's really evolved into professional athletes who, you know, have strength and conditioning, big, strong gym regimes. There's a bunch of guys that do meditate and yoga and Pilates and all that stuff. So it's definitely evolved into a, um, pretty amazing thing because it is it's life and death on there especially on the dirt bikes it, it is life life and death one one mistake can can take it all away from you wow and over the years obviously you've built yourself up in that company um, you've probably as you said seen some of the most amazing things yep. like firsthand week in week out yeah uh, you know you have seemingly you have a you know, beautiful supporting family yep. you've, you've built this career but some part of that just didn't deeply align with yourself at some point, Brownie, and um, I suppose, you know, listening to you and your podcast, yeah. and you've also written a book, and I suppose yep. this is an interesting way of saying it, you've kind of come out as some of the yeah, phrases sure. that I've heard. It's like, yep. um, you're straight, you haven't come yeah. out that way, but what you've basically said is I'm breaking away from the standard stigma yep. of what it is, what's okay and acceptable to be a man, yep. and I'm actually gonna put myself on the on the line here, if you will, and share your journey, your challenges on a mental, emotional level. Yep. And you've really, I suppose, healed yourself considerably through allowing that story to come out. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, I guess, I mean, it's easy just to kind of start start from the, the middle in this instance. You know, I got diagnosed with uh, depression and anxiety about two and a half years ago now. And, and I kind of, I had moved overseas for, for the job in in 2014 and um, stayed over there for about five years and I kind of I had a had a bad breakup and you know I was having some troubles at work and and I was very much isol I felt very much isolated over there been away from family and friends and then you know I kind of got into some pretty bad habits with the drugs and alcohol and you know I was kind of I, I I mean, as cliche as it sounds, it was re I was really just self-medicating. People were telling me that I had a drug and alcohol problem, but the, I would, the way I was rationalizing it to myself was I'm using these to kind of run away from the feelings of depression and, and suicide and, and all, all that really, really tough stuff. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, you know that that was never the answer. And... I eventually got to a point in August last year where I just like I had to get out of America and um, I, caught, I, I have a great boss who's still my boss now. I was like, yeah, let's just get you out of there and um, 
like within 10 days, I was back here and within within a couple of days, I was actually, de- Rob, Robert Fitzsimmons was one of the first people I came and saw and I was like, man, I'm really in a bad way. And like, Rob and I are mates, but like, he's not in my top 10 network of friends and stuff, but I, I just kind of felt like he was a guy I could talk to. And um, I just thought when I got back here, all, all of those feelings and stuff were gonna go away. And then I, I'd been back about two or three weeks and I'd really gotten into this good exercise regime, but I just, I was staying at my mum and dad's house and I, I just found myself on the, edge of, of, on the edge of the bed. I was staying in one morning, I was just, I was just crying and I didn't know, I just couldn't get out of bed to, to go to work. And my mum came in and was like, what, what's going on? Because this first three weeks, I was like, yeah, I'm doing great. And I was still like, I was still, I was lying to everyone but myself, you know, and I just kind of, it just kept on building up and building up. And my mum was just like, she got me to a doctor the next day. And then within like four four or five weeks, I think it was as quick as I could get to see the psychologist, uh, Dr. Gunther, who, um, who's been on, the, on my podcast. And that was, that was kind of brought us to about September last year. And then it's kind of been a 12 month healing pro- process since then and still very much like, a work in progress. I still have some bad days, but they're kind of few and far between these days. Mm. Mate, tidy little run there. Yeah, sorry, I just kept talking. That's I, phenomenal. <laughs> That's great. I don't know if I'll breathe, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it's kind of, it, it, it was tough tough to talk about back then, but and it's still tough now, but I think what I learned was what got me in this problem in the first place was not, not talking about it. And, you know, I had the... Um, I was able to kind of hide a lot over there from mum and dad back home, as an example, or my friends. So instead of a FaceTime or a Skype, it would just be a phone call. And, you mm. know, you, you can look like shit, bags under your eyes, hung over, but you can put up this illusion, this, um, this, this fake that you're, everything's okay. And, and again, it just kind of just spot, kept spiraling and spiraling out of control that I was just like, I don't, I don't even really know why I was lying to them. Like, I think I was trying to protect them. I think I had this kind of thing in my head that I wanted to make America a success for myself on my own because I had an American partner and I, I never really, um, I didn't even know how to register a car and all the stuff. I had nowhere to live. So I was living, I lived in a hotel and a motel for eight months and I was just doing some bad stuff and getting back here. I just thought was the magic wand and everything would be fixed. And, and I quickly found out that that wasn't the case and I needed to dig deeper and, and learn more about this. And that's kind of how, I guess, you know, the, my podcast started was because I just decided that if I could tell my story and make one person reach out to one person and, and, and talk and, and let them know that they can let someone know that they're not okay and they can talk to, I mean, that was kind of the kind of job done on the podcast and it's now 22 episodes later or something so yeah it's crazy and Mate. still like just learning every day amazing yeah. uh, let, let's give that a plug so well, what is the podcast and where can people listen to it mate yeah so the podcast is is called uh skip this you can listen to episode 21 with uh mitchell woods high performance coach actually on all <laughs> on all um podcast networks i'm not really the plugging guy so luke my um partner in crime he's the kind of tech tech guru is going to be very jealous when he sees your little setup here um we we basically started that when covid started so march this year um luke who who also works in in live entertainment we both kind of found ourselves with no work to do and me in particular was struggling and he's like i want to I want to try a podcast. You want to do a podcast? I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah. I'm I'm a funny guy. I can do a podcast. I'll be, (laughs) as long as I can just turn up and talk and not, not, not do anything too serious. So so I started writing some jokes for it. And it it was at the time, I think Tiger King, the Tiger King had just come out. So I'd done this like Tiger King's, King skit and I sent him this like couple of pages like this is this is my segment like this is Brownie's Brownie segment and he's like nah dude you're like you couldn't be further off the mar- mark here I want I want to, us to talk about our mental health I want mm. it and I was like oh yeah okay sweet yeah sorry my bad so that was me <laughs> just I jumped the gun a little bit there and then he's like so what what should we call it like and and we got to this point where what what the podcast wanted to feel like was the the pub conversation 
guys should be having but not. So that we should be talking about how we're feeling instead of how the Broncos or Manly are going or the Chicago Bulls are going. So it was like the pub chat that no one has. So that was kind of the working title and then it turned into skip this and that's kind of just manifested on a like pretty incredible journey. And it, I think it's probably brought us together because um, that Robbie's become a sh even bigger part of my life and obviously a big part of your life as well. And I've kind of just tried to just tried to do things that make me better. And that's where I ended up on a six week medica meditation course with you. Yeah, cool. I want to play the story back. Yeah. Um, you were diagnosed with depression. Yep. Um, I've interviewed uh, Robbie on the Love Over Fear podcast. Yep. And I'm, I'm just really interested to sort of, I don't think I've ever had like depression where I've not been able to get out of bed every day. I think I've been fortunate enough to feel the call to need to change and bring people and, and, and things into my life and not kind of push away things. Yep. I saw my mother be completely suppressing of her emotions yep. and she used to self-medicate from probably the age of 15 in my life with alcohol. Yep. And I just knew clearly that something like that wasn't the way to go. And um, Mick Miller, my mentor, and yep. your, your now friend would say, what you don't address, you suppress. Yep. And so I've been always been onto that. But have you got like a moment or when you reflect back, like what does depression look like as it builds up to being such a moment of sitting down and crying with your mum and not knowing what to do with your life? Yeah, so I think, I think kind of looking back at those previous couple of years before I kind of really addressed it properly, I, I, I really didn't under, understand it at all. And by the time I was kind of in a, de, a depress, depressive state, it was too late. Like you couldn't, you, I, didn't have the, I didn't have the coping tools. And to be honest with you, I'm still learning about the coping tools and I still learn, still learning how to manage them and whatnot. But I mean, it's like agitated, short temper, I think, for me, there's like this real level of paranoia. Like you think the worst of like someone says something and, and you just think, why is he having a crack at me? Like it's kind of like there's this real sense. I think paranoia is like the world's out to get you. Yeah, poor me, poor me, poor this. That's bullshit. And I, um, I was able to really kind of get away from anyone back here seeing it, but I really struggled to kind of contain it at work. And that's where I was being an asshole and and not being the best person, but can be super flaky on plans. Like I can commit to something six weeks down the track and then I'll get to the day of and I'm like, fuck, I just, I just can't do this. I'm not just, and it was actually happened one of, I didn't come to one of the meditation courses and that was one of the days. And at the same, I did a mental health first aid course and I skipped the first session because it was just one of, one of those times where I just like, I just can't do this. And you know, it comes like the depression states and, and and the anxiety comes with a lot of excuses. And now it's like, if I, especially with my friends, I can say, listen, hey, I'm just not feeling this. Like I know I said I'd do it, but I just don't want to do it now. And so I can have those open and honest conversations. And sometimes you just want to be left alone. And sometimes you, you just want someone to be around there, not even to talk about it, just to kind of take your mind off stuff. And um, other times you want someone there and you want to talk about your feelings. And I think that's, that's kind of the best thing about the podcast journey is being like so many people just talking and it's not, not like I had a mate last night text me and say, Hey, can I have a chat with you? And it was just, mm. he just wanted to chat. And I think that's probably been the most humbling experience of this whole journey is like the, the lines of communication that have been opened up, not just between me and my friends and family, but like friends I know and, and strangers reaching out. Like one of the things I, I've mentioned before is like me and my dad now have this like beautiful relationship where we hug each other and tell each other we love them and we say hi and, hello and bye. Like they live around the corner from where I work. So I see them probably two, three times a week. I'll go around there for lunch and we, and we hug and we've never done that. Like you hug on Christmas or your birthday, but every other time it's a handshake. And then I was at my sister's birthday this past weekend and so I'm the oldest of four kids and my youngest brother is kind of a little bit flaky like me and he turned up a couple of hours late um, and left early, but he hugged dad, dad and him hugged on the way in and way out. And I just like, I just thought that was cool because that is happening because of the podcast really. And so it's, yeah. uh, it's little moments like that. And it just kind of gave me goosebumps to think that, you know, just pe talking about stuff is, 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 is the best thing. Cause I think if I, if I had talked about it back then, I wouldn't have kind of got in the bad position that I ended up, but 
you live and you learn. So I just try and hopefully if it can help one or two people not make the same mistake and talk about it before it's too late. And mm. That mistake, is that what we're all taught as young men growing up? Boys don't cry, yep. stop being such a soft, you know yep. what, you're a pussy, yep. harden the up, you know, like yep. all that sort of stuff. Do you feel like you're a product of that kind of environment and like you just had all this stuff within you or, or what, what do you see as being the problem? Yeah, I, I, I know there's definitely, there, there is a big chat about that exactly. And I know Steve from Man Anchor, like in the Tomorrow Man, and they really emphasis on that. Gus Wallen at Gotcha for Life has been kind of, I have consider him a mentor to me now as well, kind of talk about that stigma and stuff. I, I, I would say mine's probably just a little, a little bit different. I think because I was over there, a big part of what, what I was doing was like, I didn't want my friends and family back here to worry. So I thought I was, I thought at the time, and again, you know, now I can look back at it two years later and think it was the wrong thing to do. I kind of thought I was protecting them almost. And it was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take this on on myself and try and beat this myself. And then, you know, that's when it got to the couple of times I was like, fuck, I just can't, I can't do this anymore. And, you know, you kind of start mentally writing that letter in your head and it's like, for whatever reason, I just couldn't do it. And um, um, yeah, I, I don't really know where I'm going with that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talk about writing a letter. Yeah. You've actually put pen to paper or finger to keyboard, whichever yep. one you did. Yep. Uh, what was that all about? What, what's, the, what's the memoir called? What, what's the book? What, what is that? Yeah, so, Where does that sort of fit in with everything? Yeah, so there was a couple of um, working titles. It hasn't, I haven't found a publisher for it yet because it's, <laughs> it's, it's very much my incomplete Mona Lisa. So there's a lot of work to be done there. But I had like uh, Brownie versus the Black Dog or the Brown Dog versus the Black Dog. There's a couple, couple of different ideas. I just, um, when, when, I, when I started the podcast journey, I knew it was going to be... Um, some heavy, heavy listening for those closest to me in particular. Mm. So I wanted to, I wanted to put it down in writing beforehand and just give that to my, my parents. I gave it to my parents and my family and then a couple of people close to me, which is the letter that you got. Um, and then when, even when the first podcast or episode two went to air, which I think was one of the ones I told you to listen to right up to the very moment I was having those flashbacks and anxiety I was just like I wasn't I wasn't a hundred percent sure if I was doing the right thing and I and I and I sent the um, unpublished um, audio to my parents and my three siblings I'm like listen you guys are gonna make the call on this like if this if you think this is too heavy and intense and embarrassing or you think I should keep this private where the project will be killed right away and just the overwhelming amount of support from those those five individuals are like you you have to do this and and then so that was it and yeah it's been off to the races since and then I hadn't hadn't spoken about the suicide stuff to anyone except my psychologist until that episode five which was the other one you listened to so that was another moment like when when we chatted and even Luke who the co-host was like in tears listening and I was in crying talking about it it was like oh like I don't mean, it was almost like an out of body experience and then all the support after that and um yeah it was just I just kind of knew we were doing something pretty pretty unique and special you know but I've kind of always been the guy that's kind of lit up rooms and been the loudest and funniest and most obnoxious and not everyone's cup of tea but I I, I know what I, I bring energy and like loud and and fun times so it was kind of weird to kind of almost put on a different set of shoes and be this kind of vulnerable emotional I guess mess really to be honest with you I mean it was talk, talking about some previous times so maybe mess is probably not the right word but it was just good. I had a few people reach out and said, geez, I didn't even really know you thought about stuff other than kind of sport and trying to be funny or making fun of people. So, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? It's like, you know, you say a different pair of shoes. I mean, we have a cupboard with a few different pairs of shoes. And I think that's how we are as humans. There's yep. more than just one side to us. Yeah. And being a human, um, we feel that's our, basically how we experience our lives. Yep. And to think that, you know, you didn't experience any low lows, 
and, I, and from what you're saying in your career, there's been many high highs, but yep. you almost can't have one without the other. Yep. And I think you were describing either in one of your podcasts or it's in your book, talking about, and you wish you could just manage and stay within a sweet spot between yeah. those two parts. Stay at 50. You, stay at 50, stay yep. at like in between the high high and the low low yeah, yep. and try and execute a life uh, from that place. Yep. How are you going with that? I know you said you're working on a lot of different things, but I think that that rings true. And then for me too, um, like I'm a performer, you know, I yep. used to be the funny, it's, you know, you talk about you being the funny guy. I got voted the funniest guy at the year 10 fucking formal yeah, Davidson nice. High School. Nice. So like I've been there yeah. and, um, I spewed on myself on the year 10 form. So that's pretty funny too. <laughs> <laughs> on my, on my bright blue suit, mind you as well. <laughs> Well, we won't say why I spewed on myself because my mother will be listening to this. Sorry, mum. We'll, we'll keep mum in the dark on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it like now trying to work out that sweet spot, that balance part for Brownie to, to move forward with that balance perspective? Yeah, I think, yeah, like I said earlier, it's definitely a work in progress. I'm currently, so I've been a, I've been a bad smoker, particularly the last couple of years where it's really, it's been my go-to to kind of just, that's how I would stop, you know, I'd just have a cigarette, like if a bad man was having it, that, that, the, right, the breathing, it, you're breathing, instead of breathing in your heart, you're breathing nicotine into your lungs, but kind of same principle in a, in a really strange way. So, so I, I, I've quit cigarettes on day 33 now, and I've just kind of put not drinking next to it at the moment, like the not drinking is, is not, not a forever plan, but I just thought it, I couldn't, I couldn't quit the smoking and, and, and drink throughout that period. So I was like, the goal, I, I set myself a goal of 40 days and that's at like 33. But I, I think when I set the goal, I would have said, I'm, when I set the goal, I can't wait to day 40 and have a beer, but day 40 is around the corner now. I'm not, I'm not thinking like that anymore. Mm. So I think kind of it, in more recent times that, it, that has helped a lot. And then that also tied in pretty much almost at the same time as the meditation, which is um, something that had been brought up a lot of times by by guests. You know, we've had whatever eighteen guests on the twenty one episodes, and a bunch of people had said, you know, what meditation has really helped me. And I I kind of just brushed it off. Like I think you you Robbie and I were talking about before. I, I would say there is a little bit of a stigma that you know that's that's kind of hippie stuff. You know, like and and. And, and, and you're taught to kind of um, hate what you don't know, right? It's like ign ignorance is bliss. Like if you don't know, you don't understand. So I kind of, I, I jumped into the meditation just thinking, you know, I'll give it a crack. It's like, Robbie's gonna be there to hold my hand anyway. Um, he vouched for you and I was like, then I was like, shit, this is like, I, I remember chatting to you the day after. I was like, fuck, this is the first time I've been able to switch my mind off. I can't, I couldn't even remember. Like the only other time my mind goes off is when I'm asleep and I struggle to sleep because my mind don't stop. So, so switching off has always been a battle for me. Um, I, I'm making better decisions kind of on the food and, and exercise front as I'm not drinking and smoking, but the meditation has just been an awesome tool to add to my kind of tool belt of um, managing my life because it's, yeah, it's, tricky one. I don't do myself a lot of favors a lot of the time, but meditation's just been unreal. Life-changing experience, like hands down, the current unbelievable experience. You mentioned uh, with part of your coping mechanism was with alcohol. Yep. You said that you would go out and drink, go on a bender yep. or even just a six hour drinking session, whatever yep. it was, because you knew within that period, it was just like a gateway for you to almost release those problems. Yep. However, on the back end, you had about an 80-20 yeah. uh, stat where yep. maybe 80%, if after the bender, you'd probably be inundated with more of those yep. feelings, but yep. there was a 20% was a window yep. where you wouldn't. Yep. Do you want to talk about that yep. and maybe sort of say how meditation's kind of been a process of you not having to medicate, medicate in a different way? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, how, how I described it, like the kind of last few months in America for me was just, I, I was a ticking time bomb. I was a ticking time bomb at work. I was a ticking time bomb outside of work. I was, I was, I was just doing all the wrong things, and 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 the voice inside me was forever chasing me when I was sober, 
And so what I would do is I'd, I would just plan just to obliterate myself, whether it be uh, alcohol or, or cocaine, whatever, whatever, whatever I could get my hands on, all of it. And, and I knew when, when I was kind of under the influence of those two things, that voice just that voice would seem to go to sleep. He would just disappear. Like what, maybe he's going to annoy someone else. I, but he's not. But he's not there. So I'm like, fuck yeah. So the longer I drink and 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 party, the lo- the the longer I don't have to deal with this this voice in the head. And then so you know I'd rationalise. I could, I can easily go out on a drink for 24 hours. Then I'm gonna have to sleep for 12 to 16 hours because I've missed a day's sleep. So all of a sudden, I've just about got to two days of not having to hear this person, which is me. And then so day three turns, turns around and that's when you know, like that I'm playing Russian roulette with my mental health, basically like there's an 80% ch- chance the, the problems are magnified, but there's a 20% chance that he's forgot to come back to work uh, at kind of being that voice inside my head and he's just maybe he's missed another day. So that was the, that was the kind of... Um, the game I was playing, game's probably not the right word, but that was that was what I was doing, and you know, I mean, that's not sustainable. That's when people die doing that. Yeah, that's, sure, that's, sure. that's how Heath Ledger died and stuff like that. And not not saying I'm as good looking as Heath Ledger, but I'm not far off. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was basically the game I was playing, and 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 then it just got to a point where I was like, fuck, I can't do this anymore. And I, so that's that was when I got home, and now. Um, the meditation, particularly in the last kind of month, like I haven't been having the best time at work, and and I think you know I can depth. Like I'm not afraid of a confrontation, not a physical confrontation, but like I'll always stand up for what I believe to be right. And you know, people people who have been my boss over the years will say like I'm stubborn, I'm headstrong, um, don't follow orders. Amazingly, like I'll push back. I always push back on something I don't agree with. And kind of probably in the last six weeks. Instead of like pushing back and arguing or whatever it might be, I just I hit get the little heart maths thing and just kind of have that little little four to five minute breathe and and then it's almost I forget that that thing's even happened. I can just kind of move on to the next part of my day. Mm. And so, what I've always wanted for you as soon as I met you was that you would have a tool yeah. that you could substitute for the vendoring and then help you to like. You know your version of expressing stress, anger is yeah. you know to be angry, to be frustrated, yeah. to be yeah. and I confrontational. Noticed, I, I listened to yours and Rob's podcast here, and you both kind of said the exact same thing that that was how you could manifest in that kind of that anger and kind of snap. I would just never like you're two of the most laid back, chilled people I, I've ever met. I just would never have picked that. I've never seen that. So I like obviously I haven't known you very long, but I've never seen Rob angry. Maybe on the soccer field once or twice. But he's a wog, so he's got he's got a little bit of it. He's got a little bit of that Roberto Baggio in him, you know. He's a he's a he's a, he's a multiple grand final goal scorer, so he's allowed to. So so yeah, I, but I know I'm like hot headed, like I'm a I, emotions up wear worn on my sleeve. So I know that that grinds people the wrong way at times. So now I'm just able to kind of stop and how i describe it, you you asked for a testimonial for this and i was like it allows me to stop stop to smell the roses mm. so if i can trampling all over i'm sorry for the f-bomb instead of trampling all over that rose bed i can stop and smell them no, no you can swear mate that's fine i'll just put a little disclaimer at the start <laughs> and uh explicit material yeah like on all the rap albums that i have at home <laughs> um so is it fair to say now that like moving forward it's been a success like you've you've got something to stop pause as in your words smell the roses yep. so with what you know now what, what you've been on through your journey what does this sort of look like opening up for you moving forward like what does the future sort of smell feel taste like for brownie compared to what you were creating in the past what, what do you think oh that that's a good question i like um i do like the little that um heart math thingy that you recommend we buy so i can see that i've meditated you know 46 of the last 47 days i'm a stats guy so i've only missed one day since we started this course which healthy habits have never been something i've been good at like like that's i'm a world world champion beer drinker and cigarette smoker and vendor are but healthy habits i've really i've really struggled to keep in my life and this is to be honest with you, this is probably the first one that I've just kind of 
kept and put into my routine. Like Rob will tell you, I've come in, come to fit some in waves. Like I could do six days in a row and then disappear. I'm having some back trouble at the moment. So I'm just kind of staying, just doing my own walking, exercising. So kind of keeping up those kind of trying to do 15,000 steps a day type things. So it's kind of real low impact stuff, but I'm, I'm meditation's just a part of my life now. It's just, I think that's, that's cool. And I'll always make time to do it. Whereas in the past, I feel like there's always an excuse, you know, the four o'clock class rolls around at fifth and it's like, oh, I could probably do this spreadsheet instead. Or, you know, you just, your back's all you're tired. There's kind of, I've always been good at the excuses and not just the fit, fit stuff. That's like um, meeting up with someone or a doctor's appointment, whatever it might be. Like, but I just don't make any excuses for the meditation because I know exactly like what it's going to do for my day and, and how I feel straight after it. Mm, phenomenal. Yeah, it's cool. Let's, um, we're sort of getting towards the end of our yep. chat, Brownie, but there might be people listening to this out there who have chronic anxiety, stress, depression, mm -hmm. whatever. What advice would you give to yourself knowing what you know now uh, about maybe addressing this earlier? Yep. Is there something you'd say to these people to help them get on the front foot with their depression, anxiety? Yeah, I, I think like I probably the thing that I didn't do right from the very start was I didn't talk more to those closest to me. I think that was, I think there was an element at the start of a bit of embarrassment, a bit of stubbornness about, you know, trying to just not acknowledge that it, there was something wrong. Um, go and talk to someone like the psychology psychologist has been um, so great for me. And I saw two psychologists over in America and I hated both of them. I was like, this is just, this is just a waste of time. You know, it's like, and I was, I was going, kick, I went along there kicking and screaming to be fair, because it was basically what my loved one said, you have to do this. Otherwise you, you, you're not, we're not going to allow you to stay in America type thing. That was kind of, in a roundabout way, what 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 was agreed to after my kind of meltdown, and um, so I went there, kind of again, kind of just with your eyes closed, you know, just again, you you fear the unknown, and I I kind of didn't didn't gel with either of them, and then there's a statistic that Gus Warren said it can take seven seven psychologists before you can see set six different people, and it might not be till the seventh that you find the person that you gel with, and. For me, I was lucky it was the third one and it was Gunther and it was in September last year. And now like I see him, I was back then, I was seeing him weekly, but now it's like every four or six weeks we chat. And it's another thing. I think it's just a tool that I'll use for the rest of my life because he can kind of help unpack the layers. And if you've got some issues and he's been kind of the real changer, but just the like the relationship with my family's family and friends now. and. And one of the questions my mum asked was like, how far can you push? Like, what, what, what are we, and what are we, and what aren't we allowed to kind of say and do around you? And, and what I did was, was when I kind of came out, as you kind of said earlier, I basically, you know, your mental health is under lock and key in your head. And you're the only one with the, with the key to this lock, but by, me talking to my friends and family and and to the public via the podcast i basically gave everyone around me um a key a key to that lock to get into that head and that heart of mine which i've kind of protected so so determinedly and, and wrongly at times so i think you know just having that conversation is now like my mum said hey Nath, i think you're down you're down what's going on and i can say you know what i'm having a bad day at work or whatever it might be i drank too much on the weekend so just having those conversations, I think, is the most important thing. Yeah. Just talking. I mean, it's just. I mean, it's pretty obvious, really. It's like meditation. You just it, all you're doing is breathing. Phenomenal, and that's a big part of what I want to people to hear on this show. I mean, getting towards the end of your story, like, what are the things you've you've expressed? Meditation's key. Yep. Being open, being vulnerable, being. Yep. Uh, explanatory about how you feel yep. with your family, your yep. loved ones and your friends uh, going to see a psychologist. I think what's really cool is like you're just so determined and brave throughout yeah. this whole Thanks. process. Yeah. Like you just went like MJ game six against yeah. Utah, step yeah. back <laughs> um, to win it in terms of like, okay, if I feel better, the more I can describe and connect with others and share yeah. what I'm going through, the better I'm going to feel. So that you took it to the next level with the podcast. Yeah, for sure. 
for people that maybe don't have that kind of caliber of bravery and that sort of um, out there personality yeah. and they've been bottling this up, yeah. um, what was it like when you had to tell the people you love? Like you, you, you obviously had the recordings of the podcast, you had the, the memoir you've written. Was there a moment you doubted yourself in wanting to share that with people to protect them or what was going on there? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. I remember shaking as I handed over that, that 20 page document that when I gave it to my mum and dad and, and that, was a, that was a tough conversation to have. But I think if I didn't have that conversation when I did, I, might, I definitely, wouldn't, definitely wouldn't be on this podcast and I might not be here on this earth period. I, 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 I truly believe that. And so I, I, I kind of, I went kind of next level ballsy to kind of put it on a podcast, but you don't have to do it my way on the podcast to have all, have this exact same experience because you don't need this microphone to talk to your friends and family or go see a doctor and see a psychologist. I'm just kind of, I'm just warts and all telling this story with, you know, it wasn't why we started this podcast. It was kind of very self-serving. It was just getting some stuff off our chest, but I know it's grown into something bigger than that and you know it's it's a special feeling like when you get a message from a stranger saying hey thanks thanks you i relate to what you're saying i've, I've contacted my family who I haven't spoken to for six months or whatever it might be there's wow. it's just um or even the text message i got last night from a mate just saying hey i need to chat it's like it's it's the inspiration you need to keep going and um I think at the start it, there was kind of, there was maybe just a little bit of like shit. It, is it embarrassing that my I'm just kind of putting all my cards on the table? But I kind of quickly got past that. I've always been the loudest, uh, most obnoxious, annoying guy at, everywhere I go. Whatever whatever you want to call it. depends who you ask for what they would describe it as. So why not be that the loudest person with these emotions and feelings and vulnerabilities as well? Now it's kind of probably how I'd sum it up. Mm. And what I love, and we talked before about this podcast, the idea of making meditation cool. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, and in my, I've been looking to expand and to be more um, sharing with my emotions and feelings. And, you know, you kind of get that like, like stop talking and, and shut up and just get yeah. on with it because we're all getting on with it thing. And, um, you know, I can relate to, you know, you like shaking, handing over that mm. letter to your parents and your loved ones. Uh, I, I haven't seen a therapist as such, but I've sort of had a mentor or a coach. And one time I went to this group and it was like once a month we all got together. Yeah. And it was me and about 50 plus women. Because mm -hmm. typically speaking, most guys don't talk sure. like we don't speak this yeah, shit. Yeah, sure. But we're like demystifying and debunking yeah. that this is part of our you know, yeah. inner layers yep. and this needs to be a standard yeah, for sure. narrative. And I had to, well, I wanted to, and it was sort of like, well, why are you here? And like, what's the biggest challenge that you're going through in your life? And for me, having to like stand up and like to find my voice, mm. yeah. which is what we're doing yeah, absolutely. to share all the shit that I was going through. And it yeah. was just like the challenges of having a mum who like you loved, you know, she loves you, but she just couldn't, you couldn't shake her and wake her yeah. the fuck up yeah. to just come back. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man, I, I can feel what it's like to like share and get those initial emotions and feelings out of your system. Yeah, and it's a I, huge release is what I'm hearing you say. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's like, you know, like the worst thing you can say to someone who's having troubles, like, you know, just suck it up. Those people were people worse off than you. Like, just, you know, just stop, stop being a, stop being a wimp, you know? So that's, don't, don't say that at all. It's like, I think, um, just just listen to people and um, one a good thing I learned was like when I was when I was in a really bad way and I think I got to that really irrational um, thinking like this guy's out to get me blah 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 I hate my job whatever it might be um, I got explained to me was if your best friend came to you with um, these exact same problems how how would you advise him compared to how you're how you're acting and advising it, yourself you have, you're doing two totally different things right so it's like just you sometimes have to take a step back and just of your own problems and i think it's the same way same way when you when someone's telling you their problems you don't think about how you would act think about how they would act so i think 
it's kind of, you know, and I think you kind of really talk about selflessness and empathy throughout the course. And, and that's just another part of it is just kind of just listening, just, just listening. I think is the best thing to do. And yeah, meditate. I like to meditate. We meditated a little bit beforehand. I've done two little meditations today. So yeah, I got my 20 in before we did this. Yeah. I, I've, I've been a little bit, I, I haven't quite been getting the um, scores I, I ha- were, but got a lot <laughs> going on at the moment. So yeah, uh, let's talk about that quickly before we wrap up. But how, how powerful is it have something tangible like what we do with the HeartMath technology? Measure 150 uh, infrared bits of light are being sprayed into your earlobe, measuring yep. the expansion, contraction, beat to beat difference between your heartbeat, really giving us a window into your nervous system. And then you can yep. get stats and build numbers yep. on that state of coherence. I've been taught, and I hadn't had any tangible skills, I just had like a, a person who I would ask about and talk through if I was really getting this right. Yep. What was that like for you as a bit of a stats man and yeah. just to have something tangible to build up your confidence with your meditation? Yeah, I think for sure I wouldn't have meditated like 47 out, out of the last 48 days if I didn't have documentation of all 40, and it's not 40, 47 meditations because there's a bunch of days where I've done two and three meditations during the day. So I can see, you know, those quantifiable results. And and now I can almost, I can just check it afterwards. And I know, I can almost guess I'm pretty good that I know that I've scored, you know, 2.1 today because my mind's wandering and I'm kind of thinking about my to-do list. But then there's times I can score a 4.6 or a 5 because I'm completely like I've almost fallen asleep during the meditation and mm. kind of really got into the heart. And, and I like getting into the belly, actually. That was the, the last one we did here at Fitzum. And um, I like just having quantifiable results. It's just such a, such a good thing for me. And it's kind of motivation that kind of and it helps you learn, right? Like like you said, you you learn without that. I. I don't know if I could learn learn too good without it, but I like I, it's just a great little tool. Yeah, you can buy it from I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Give it the plug. Yeah, or go to mitchellwoods.com.au and ask the question about where where to find it. That's it, mate. <laughs> yep, yep. I think it's Maca- some Macarthur Bloody Health or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. He'll you know what Mitch will put the link link up on the uh, on the website on the we'll, Facebook page. We'll put it in the, the show notes. Show notes. Um, Speaking of stuff we're going to put in the, the show notes is that next Monday, the 16th, we're going to be starting the next yes. men's meditation, round yes. 2.0. Yes. You're going to be there. Yes. Robbie Pisto is going to be yes. there uh, back through that process. So yeah. I'm looking forward to having you in that. Yeah, I'm stoked to uh, get the invite. To um, not, I never really got invited back to classes through my high school career. So that's, um, this is something new to put on the um, fridge for mum at home. They got invited back to a class. So yeah, I'm, ex- I'm excited, man. It's just... I. I've um, been pushing the messaging about the the um, meditation since I've started it. It's it's been a like I said a life changing experience. So thank you, uh, Woodsy, for kind of coming into my life. And you know I know we're going to be friends for for a long time to come. And I'm excited to kind of watch some new people get on the journey that I just had because I know what it's done for me. So I'm excited to learn a bit more and watch some other people kind of have a similar journey to what we got to have with you. So yeah, beautiful. Thanks, man. Uh, let's reiterate where we can connect with you again. Like, tell us about the podcast and where we can catch up with that. Yeah, so uh, skip this podcast is the name. Um, Google it. Instagram. I don't really know that stuff to be honest. But yeah, I mean, where Luke and I are always there for a chat. If you need, if you just, if you, if you want to, got a question or call me. I'm not going to give out my phone number because there's probably lots of girls listening. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're, we're filming this now, so they're not going to only hear your beautiful voice. They're actually going to see your your beautiful aesthetics as well. I got a head for radio, mate. So I um, <laughs> thank you for that. We might uh, we might uh, have to put some CGI on that, but no, it's um, yeah. Skip this podcast <laughs> is where you can find us. Have a listen. The latest episode is Mitch with with Mitch, and we kind of talk a lot about the meditation and what that's done for me. I mean, there might be a few things we've spoken about twice, but. I, that doesn't matter because it's a great message and it's it's a good thing to do. So it's not just for hippies and hipsters. Mm, and then in your day job, how can we support the Nitro Circus and stuff? Is that what's happening with that moving well, forward you post can, COVID? You can wear your mask so we can so we can go back to normal life. But um, we we are hopeful. We've got an event in October next year in Brisbane, and then some summer shows in North America in the back end of 
second half of next year. So still, still a while away before we uh, start doing shows again. But I mean, there's much bigger problems in the world than Nitro Circus not being able to tour. So um, check out the socials. We've got lots of uh, cool content up there that I'm kind of helping make. So that's, there's plenty to do. There's, you can easily get lost on the Nitro Circus Facebook page for a couple of hours. I'm sure you have. <laughs> I've been having a few stickies. Guilty. Yeah. I'm following the uh, Skateboard League, uh, Nitro Circus, and there's just some amazing stuff yeah. going. Before on that, I only really was um, following Red Bull Yep. But, um, yeah, you know, but, there's a few, probably a bit of crossover there for a few, yeah, some of the athletes. Yeah, we're, it was a we're more in bed with Monster, so. Okay, sorry. Uh, shout out to Monster. <laughs> shout out to Monster. Wasn't Mon- aware of Mon- that. Mon- no, yeah. Mitch, thank you for everything you're doing, man. I think your, your messaging, like, like I said, you've, I've listened to a few of the podcasts before coming on today. It's like beautiful messaging and what you're doing is, is, is life changing. And I think you said on our podcast, you're... You, you don't change lives, you're giving people tools to change their own lives. And I think that's a, that's a really good message and you're doing brilliant things. So thank you for having, having me on today. Thanks, Unreal mate. Chat. Last, last sort of question before we get out of here, Brownie. Yeah. What's your de- definition of self-love? Self-love. Oh, God. Okay. Just, just to put you under the pump. Yeah. yeah you've learned so I much. Mean, I mean, I think, you know, I think love comes in so many different shapes and form like i love robbie you know but i i I love my girlfriend differently and then i love my parents differently again but uh, self-love oh i think just trying to be comfortable in your own skin Mm. might be i don't know and like it's okay that you're not perfect and you know i think your your life is your your own artwork right it's your um you can shape what that art, artwork looks like. You can make the good choices or the bad choices. I've made plenty of bad choices and now I'm just trying to make more more good choices than bad choices. And the painting's not finished, but it's, um, I've got the, um, what, do you, what, what is it, easel? I've got the easel and the, and the um, fucking, what do you call it? The piece of paper you're painting on. I don't know what the on. fuck yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Self-love is art. <laughs> Self-love is being okay not being okay. Self love is. We can get a new canvas out. Yeah, canvas. That's there what I'm we looking. Go. That's the channel that you Yeah, play. there you go. Yeah, so the canvas is on the easel, and there's a bit of work to be done. But I, 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 I like being vulnerable and um, just being open now. So I think that might be part of my self love and journey is just you know telling people I'm not okay and telling people I am okay. Phenomenal, mate. Well, uh, I appreciate your story and your journey yeah, and thanks, your man. openness. And um, I'm looking forward to, yeah, whatever the future brings. It, it's got a really good feeling for me. Absolutely. And, and as well, Robbie, who's um, been listening into this session today. Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, thanks, Woodsy. I uh, appreciate you. You're a very easy human being to talk to. So thanks for letting me tell my story. Thanks for coming on the show, bro. Good man. Thanks, Woodsy. Done. <laughs>